Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On September 10th, 1999, the movie Fight Club starring Brad Pitt and Ed Norton was premiered at the Venice Film Festival in Italy. Now, two days later, a little over 4,400 miles west, a new fight was underway in Cleveland, Ohio. And as we would find out over the course of the past two decades, the fight might just be in their heads too. But nonetheless, we are talking about the return of the Dog Pound. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step up the DeLorean, the date is September 12th, 1999, and we are in Cleveland, Ohio. It's Sunday Night Football. It's opening week of the 1999 NFL season, and the Cleveland Browns are back, baby. This week's guest must have been just pumped out of the atmosphere, because he made up his mind when he was going to be a Browns fan. This is an exciting time for him. Wait wait a minute, though. Let me stop right there. Because I said he decided to be a fan of the Cleveland Browns. And that's not just a, a smart gun because of the fact that they haven't really had a whole lot of success. I'm just saying... You don't just decide to be a fan, right? I mean, you're born into it. But au contraire, my friend. For you see, this week's guest, he couldn't be born into an NFL franchise by the location of where he lived. Because this week's guest, Peter Boner, comes to us from all the way across the pond. Deutschland! Germany! Europe! Not here in the United States. We'll get into the story of why I say Peter decided to become a Cleveland Browns fan in the interview, and how a German became an NFL fan. We'll talk about how a German became an NFL fan, a whole bunch of different German-related NFL history. But before we do, I gotta ask you a favor. Or maybe it's, well, I guess doing yourself a favor. Because if you enjoy this show, I gotta ask that you please mash that little subscribe or follow button on whatever podcast player you're listening to right now. That way, you'll get notified as soon as a new episode is released. What do you got to lose? It's free. And speaking of free, we have a newsletter at the Sports History Network. Or maybe it's called an email list, whatever you want to prefer to call it. But this newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on over here at the Sports History Network, including the episodes that we release on our podcast, articles that don't even include the podcast, giveaway announcements, new show announcements, so much more. And oh yeah, again, it's free to join the list. So if you're interested, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash newsletter. That's it. Now, let's get into this interview with Peter Bonert hailing all the way from Deutschland. So that's, that, let's start right there. So that's where I wanted to get. How did I get involved with talking to Peter? Why a guy living in Germany, how did you fall in love with the NFL and football in general? Let's tell tell me your NFL origin story. Of course. So, um, yeah, normally there's a person who attracts you to something. And uh, with me, it was my brother. Uh, he's five years older than me. And in the mid-90s, when American sports had uh, a bit more media attraction uh, than the years before in Germany, yeah, he uh, introduced me into uh, the American sports, uh, first NBA and then 
uh, mid nineties, I also wondered, okay, what that sport on, on a grass field and they don't, uh, they call it football and don't play it with their feet. And so I wondered about that. I was 10 years old, around about nine to 10 years old. And, um, Yes, just uh, wondered uh, what that sport was, and my brother introduced me into that. And uh, yeah, uh, from that time on, um, I got more and more interested in uh, in American football. And um, during the last years, uh, also into pro football history. <laughs> So then, okay, you, your brother got you into football and American football, of course. I refer to it just as football as, as uh, being of over on this side of the States and everything. But what was it just the general – what got you into gravitating towards that sport? You said basketball was your first uh, introduction, but then into football. What was the difference for you as opposed to like why did you like that sport? First of all, uh, because nobody here played it uh, in that time. Uh, nowadays, a bit, few more people and uh, more and more media attraction uh, is there for for American football and especially for the NFL. So, uh, but in that time, yeah, nobody played it, or at least from from my perspective, nobody played it. I lived in a tiny uh, village, two and a half thousand people and yeah, um, uh, no, no big city uh, um, r around there where football has been played to that extent where, where you got it, uh, yeah, where, where you get it and, and, and where you see it. So um, um, yeah, that, that was something that it, it's something special and, and um also, the fact that it was not a fluent sport like uh, soccer, you call it, but it was more about uh, yeah chess on the field and and um, it yeah I, I saw that there's much more tactics uh, involved than. Uh, but, but I, I got later to it, but, but at the beginning I was just, I wondered about the uh, sports and why people are standing and moving then five to 10 seconds and then stopping, huddling, uh, lining up, uh, moving ten, five to 10 seconds and a referee calls, flags are thrown and uh, all that stuff. In, uh, and also all the rules that, that you need to know and, and you got to dig deeper into that and all, always... What what I found interesting uh, with the time uh, going on was that after a while you dig deeper and you um, discover new things that are also important for the sport and uh, yeah all of that uh, was was uh, why I I'm so attracted to American football. <laughs> yeah, I so I'm, I. I was always a football fan growing up, just my father and then my grandfather. And the listener of the show knows that we talk about that almost at nauseum of my my love for the Detroit Lions. <laughs> and I so I tried soccer in school one time. I think it was seventh or eighth grade. Uh, it was a different type of game. Like you said, it was this constant nonstop, always going. And it, I, I played um, in the defense. I played a little bit goalie, too, but it was more of the defenseman. I, I don't know if that would be called the back back man maybe i'm not sure what that's called and then like you said so a different type of sport but when i was in germany it was the year that they went to the finals for the world cup and i was actually in munich the time when they won whatever the round is like i don't know if they call it semifinal. the the game right before they go to the finals that city was just crazy it was like yeah. the whole everybody in the streets the whole city was shut down i mean like the passion that an entire city had for the love for that sport was amazing and then the entire country what was it 2014 or uh, in, uh, i think it was 2000 and 2002 maybe they didn't make it to the finals but uh, wherever yes, they then they made it to the final 2002 they played in the final and it was yeah the beginning of the public viewing as we call it in germany uh, era when when People went out and watched the games outside and uh, yeah, more and more in the crowd. 
that was the beginning and uh, it, it grew up but uh, yeah football uh, soccer as as you call it uh, was was uh, during the 2000 until to 2014 18 where we uh, failed <laughs> during the world cups in 2018 uh, i think it was a good time to go out watching soccer and the games of the yeah, national team and and so on so soccer is more cultural in in germany and yeah, um, it, it's all. Yeah, when I read about Walter Cam and his idea about uh, the team sports of uh, American football and and the reason behind a man growing up and uh, yeah, on the one hand uh, fighting each other, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, being respectful and and that foot football American football um, shapes used to become a man and uh, it's it's also with soccer in germany that uh, there was a guy in a school who built up um, who was considered as weird and and crazy for playing soccer in the 1920s 1910s and yeah it's it's comparable to american football <laughs> yeah i can relate for for the football side as far as american football for when you go through the things that you do with your team together to go through and, and unfortunately my team was just like the detroit lions we didn't have a lot of success we had to go through a lot of failures and heartbreaks to not really get many victories but what we went through as a team to fight through that really helped me throughout the rest of my life and i'm imagining that all sports are that way i mean i played basketball baseball but just for me personally, I can't, you know, that's the closest thing I can compare being in the military would be American football as far as like the drills that you have to go through, the the uh, physical, that fitness that you have to go through, that type of thing. And, mm-hmm. and the almost like the fighting, like you said, I guess hockey might be the same way, but it's just something that was different for me. And the thing that I was curious about for you then would be, OK, I love the Detroit Lions, right? Now, you like a team that is typically during my lifetime not had any success either. How did you clash? Like, how did you grasp onto the Cleveland Browns to be your team? So, as I told you in the mid 90s, I, I started to, to be interested in the NFL, especially. And, and there was a team that went out of town, and all of the United States was wondering why do they do that? And, and uh, that's something uh, absolutely not uh, okay for for american sports culture uh, starting with paul brown over jim brown and uh, all, all all the stuff behind of course in, during that time i didn't realize uh, which persons and which history is uh, behind that of the cleveland browns but i i wondered okay there is a the relocation stuff I was uh, aware of that is uh, another kind of um, in American sports and in European sports. But um, yeah, what I found interesting is that they said, okay, Cleveland Browns, we keep color, we keep mascot, we keep uh, uh, everything, the history behind the franchise in the town and wait for an investor coming in and, and, trying to build a new stadium and so i saw there there is something behind that team that organization and and uh, that's why i didn't yeah i saw that and i thought okay maybe baltimore ravens but i, I said no that's a new team I, I stick with the bronze and wait for for a new team coming uh, later on and and when it came uh, i looked and saw okay maybe uh, i i don't go to the winning team, which were the Ravens at that time, <laughs> uh, with Ray, uh, Ray Lewis and um, the Super Bowl against the Giants, for example. And yeah, I, I said I stick to the Browns and we'll see what uh, will come. And um, until now, I only know two or three people in my wider relationship area <laughs> who is also... Uh, who supports the Browns and but but as a Brown you Brown fan Browns fan you're an outsider and that's also very attractive in my opinion. But th- that was the reason behind uh, becoming a Browns fan. And um, yeah, as you know, uh, 
soccer also is very culture based in Germany and and very traditional uh, sports and and if you for for my person I, I was a supporter of a team because my my father was supporter of that team and and so on and I thought maybe uh, with the Browns it's, it's the same idea and uh, as I saw the games I watched in the US and I talked to other supporters it's the same and uh, families are uh, involved with the team for decades and uh, yeah it's the same for me and and. It's something I understand is why I wouldn't change to the Jaguars or <laughs> some teams like that. You know, you bring up a good point because I brought this up on the show before too. I moved to, to Texas for a little bit in Dallas and, you know, America's team, the Cowboys. And mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find myself to want to, I, like I tried a little bit to be a, like a little bit of a hometown fan of the Cowboys, but I still was always the Lions. And you had a unique perspective or uh, you got a chance to kind of grow up with a team, you know, first coming to a sport, even though you were in it for a little bit. And then you this this Cleveland Brown, like baby franchise, even though they had all that history. But that's kind of kind of a different thing. I, I guess if I were to try to pick up, uh, I don't know, like find a soccer team or something over in Germany and I would have to I mean, I guess. I guess Munich Bayern or something like that. I'd have to go with just because of the the history that I know there. And what are some like what's the most popular soccer team in in Germany? It's it's Bayern Munich actually, but more because of the success. It's maybe uh, similar to the Cowboys <laughs> uh, <laughs> to the past success, but uh, yeah, there, there are uh, blue collar teams like Sch Schalke or Borussia Dortmund and 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 teams like that and. Here in Germany, maybe you know Kaiserslautern from the um, um, airbase uh, that, that there in, in uh, the U.S. airbase. It's located in Kaiserslautern, and um, they had a team 100k uh, population, and uh, they have a team SFC Kaiserslautern, and they also have a foot American football team, the K-Town Bears, I believe that's their name, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, so as the FC Kaiserslautern, it was a team, blue collar p guys, and um, very traditional, very um, history based. And the first World Cup team of Germany was had five guys from that team, and as you can imagine, a very tiny town of one hundred thousand people. They have it, had a team in the nineteen fifties, which was champion twice, and. Uh, five guys of that team went out and won the World Cup in 1954, and uh, yeah, so much history around it. Uh, and and it's just 100 kilometers, just 70 miles from my hometown area, and and that's why I was attracted to that team and to that club back then when I was young. <laughs> So they would be kind of like the Green Bay Packers of the NFL, a exactly. small little town. Exactly. But they <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, it's the Green Bay Packers, right? Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, again, that it's almost as we're having this conversation, I'm going through my head thinking how interesting or how, I don't want to say unique or fun it must be to be able to say, okay, this is a brand new across the pond league that I get to be a fan of instead of just kind of being stuck with, I don't want to say stuck because I'm, I'm a diehard Lions fan, but... Yeah. I was stuck as a Lions fan. I mean, I'm never going to not be a Lions fan, but the chance to be able to look at a new league and pick based on preferences, my team. And then the reasons, like you said, the Browns and they kind of got the whole shaft and stuff. And then they, you know what the Ravens leave in town and everything, well, yeah. becoming the Ravens. So it's kind of cool. I mean, speaking of that, let's, let's talk about a new quarterback coming into town. This is like instant history. So what's your thoughts on getting Deshaun Watson on your team? Are you happy? Not happy? What's going on there? So I, I'm, uh, I mean, as you can see in the media now um, in, in the U.S., uh, it's the same for me. Mixed feeling. Uh, I think on the one hand th there may be an option of, of winning something big, and then within the next two or three years, of course. Uh, I like Baker from a personal uh, point of view. Um, uh, also very genuine as he always demonstrated and and uh, but maybe uh, not the Russell Wilson guy uh, the Cleveland Rounds he 
expected when when he came in into the league, and, and that's why he was picked as number one uh, overall in 2018 because people thought, okay, maybe we have the, uh, another kind of Russell Wilson quarterback type, uh, same size and and uh, same arm strength, but maybe uh, yeah, maybe uh, he, he doesn't uh, he, he he didn't get it to to that point and and that, that's the reason why they changed it and as i recently talked to someone here in germany to explain him why there's so much around uh, trading now that was not part of the nfl five years ago or ten years ago i think with the new cba uh, which was uh, which came into place uh, five or ten years ago With the rookie uh, rookie uh, salary cap, uh, thanks to John Marcus Russell <laughs> and and his uh, mega contract, but uh, I think due to that you have much more uh, turnovers or turnaround of of teams than it was ten years ago, where you had where you stick to your quarterback five or seven years, and. Um, Having said that, uh, Deshaun Watson, um, I'm, I'm, I like his attitude. I like his way of play. And I know that Kevin Stefanski had to change his offense, will have to change his offense and, and his, um, strategy a bit. And I'm, I'm, I'm very curious what it will look like. Um, because we go a bit more spread, uh, a bit less tight end oriented. Um, There is no fullback on the roster uh, currently, uh, as I saw um, that Janowicz, um has has changed the team. So, from a tactics point of view, very interesting, very curious. Deshaun Watson, I like the type of player he is, and with all that uh, accusations he had to deal with, I, I can imagine that it's not easy being a superstar like him. But it sev was severe accusations, and um, yeah, as I said at the beginning, mixed feeling in that regard. So to that point, well, I mean that that's that's probably a, not an understatement. I mean, of course, there's mixed feelings. You don't know are these accusations true or false. And if if I look at it just from a football, pure football perspective, then I think if I were in your shoes, I would be excited because of the. The draft picks that you had to give up was a pretty hefty price. However, if, again, all, all the accusations aside, on the field, that type of a player staying, if he stays healthy, the dynamic of which he can bring to that team that already has a lot of pieces around it. I mean, I could see Kareem Hunt playing more than um, he did in the past because of the style of play that he's able to do. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, also... Uh Something I, I, I liked uh, around that is, uh, okay, we, we go, Mari Cooper is now on the team and, 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 and we have a true number one wide receiver and, uh, okay, Jarvis is not on the team. Maybe he comes back. It's in discussions, but, um, yeah, from, from, a, as you said, uh, uh, from pure football perspective, interesting how the offense will change, how it will evolve. And uh, that's something you, yeah, as a bronze fan, you s look forward to to have a team that's uh, competitive and that uh, has not uh, won it one or like against the Steelers in 2020 playoffs. <laughs> okay, the Chiefs game, but but it was due to Mahomes' injury. But um, yeah, so very exciting would be too much to say at the moment because I just. Uh, Try to get the feeling, as maybe all Browns fans at the moment with Deshaun at the helm, but uh, we'll see. So maybe it comes uh, more and more with the season, and the more W's we get, the more excited uh, you will be, as always. <laughs> all right. So speaking of excited, and we'll stay first in the current year, the upcoming season, before we start heading back in time. Uh, how how excited were you when they first announced that this is going to be the first year where a regular season game is played in Germany? Um, honestly, uh, as for me, it, it, uh, I find it interesting. But uh, for me, I'm 
okay, I, I see there's so much media attraction the last five years here in Germany about uh, the NFL and uh, it, it, it became more, it has become more popular in the uh, public TV and, um, But for me, as I'm interested in, have been interested in the NFL for the last 25 years, um, okay, I get the feeling for the people around, but uh, I'm so much into it that I'm not looking, okay, it's a game in Germany, nice to go there, to go to Munich or to go to, to Frankfurt and watching the games. But um, there's very, the people here in Germany are, are wild and, and they go for it. There were in the first two days 400,000 ticket requests. So yeah, it's uh, for, for 60,000 places. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, it's great that uh, it becomes more international uh, um, um, in, uh, at all, uh, the NFL. But for me, It happened here in Germany. It takes a bit of the attraction of the NFL being the American sports, of course. Maybe you can understand that from my perspective because now it's in Germany and okay, and the media attracts it. And, but, but nobody from the media knows about uh, the first NFL player in, the, in 1920 and uh, from Germany in the NFL. So, Yeah, it's, it's, it's also there. It's a mixed feeling, but uh, I'm happy for for all people here in Germany to to. I can understand what you're what you're uh, kind of alluding to or getting at there. When so I love the NFL. I I, I watch. I have the games on. I, I love watching every game possible. But the more times they play it, when it was just Sunday and you could only watch it Sunday. It's like there's that one day of the week, then Monday. Okay, you have Monday and Sunday. Cool. But then now it's a it's a Thursday night game. Now it's a potential Tuesday, Wednesday game. So it, it almost waters it down to that point. Yeah, so maybe you're also a traditionalist as I am. And as I am as a German, so overtime discussion and now at the uh, um, off-season uh, meeting in the end of all, all of that and Uh, guys uh, and friends uh, of, of me who are interested in the NFL the last five to ten years uh, say, oh, we, we need that uh, um, um, shootout contest in the overtime or uh, we need ha both teams having the ball uh, during the, uh, in the overtime. And I'm more from a traditional perspective. I, I don't see that in the... Like, like them and it's also interesting to have the, uh, those discussions and, and to that extent so yeah I'm, I'm a traditionalist and uh, I see it more from that perspective always <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm more of what you could call a hybrid I'm not a traditionalist I, okay. I, am, I, I have a perspective of the past and I love to honor the past but at the same time I'm, I'm always willing to um, look at what possibilities could be and I'm not I No matter what we, whatever they decide on is going to be right and wrong and it'll be changed again. And then that'll be right and wrong. And it's, that's how I kind of look at stuff. Always, I'm, yeah. I'm always going to enjoy the game no matter what. I mean, it's got to be very drastically changed for me to not. I've drank in the Kool-Aid too much to be able to say, oh, I'm not going to watch this anymore. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, speaking of off, let's go to off season, though. This is that time where we go back in time a little bit. 2013 NFL draft. You were actually at that draft, right? Right. Uh, one of the worst drafts in the last decade, or two, uh, 10 years, I, I believe. But I, I, at that time, I, I'm, I'm a um, legal counsel. I uh, had uh, my education in, in, in laws. And um, during that time, a friend of me was in New York. I was in London, uh, so kind of traineeship for three months and from February to April, and uh, I decided to go to visit him in uh, uh, April 2013, and uh, um, I choose uh, the last weekend in April <laughs> for one reason, <laughs> um, yeah, to go there and visit the NFL draft uh, at the Radio City Music Hall, and, and he was at a law firm near the Rockefeller Plaza, so it was three or four blocks And uh, then uh, when I arrived with my uh, all my luggage for the five, six days, 
we went to the uh, queue at the Radio City Music Hall and got the tickets. So it, it was not uh, that public event as it is today. And um, yeah, second uh, second night uh, we queued up and uh, all of a sudden I recognized uh, there is a guy um, who I know from TV and it was Roger Goodell and uh, I shook hands with him and uh, told him that I'm from Germany and uh, he was in awe would would be an, a bit ex of an exaggeration and maybe, but uh, yeah that that was cool I took a picture that I sent you and. Uh, Yeah, the, all the event for me was very special and was a, for me a lifetime experience back then because I always dreamt of going there and uh, I was able to do that. And DeAndre Hopkins was one of the good players uh, being drafted uh, at that draft. And uh, from a German perspective, Björn Werner, a defensive end going in the first round, and he was also in the green room at that draft. Uh, he, he went to Indianapolis. So there were three Germans uh, at that draft, Pjörn Werner, maybe he, one or two people from his family as well. I, I don't know it exactly. And uh, me and my friend from Germany uh, were at the, um, at the crowd and uh, also as, as I have it written down at Twitter or had it written down at Twitter, in my personal profile, uh, supporting an actor at uh, draft day uh, with Kevin Costner <laughs> because uh, um, such draft functioned as uh, footage for, for, for draft day. Maybe you know about that or not. Well, I, I didn't realize that was the draft that, that it was. That it was uh, I knew that they had some live footage and stuff. So that makes sense then why you would have that. And I always wanted to go to New York City Radio Hall for the draft i was able to go to the one in dallas but that wasn't the yeah. same type of like little small event that's like that little uh what do you want to say uh intimate type of an event mm -hmm. and uh, speaking of that okay so the photo that you sent me of you and roger goodell i gotta tell you this he looked a little bit of what you might call betrokken did i say that right betrokken uh... betrokken yeah <laughs> so he looked like he had a few he was a little disheveled if you wouldn't if you actually i'm not yeah. sure where was that at the bar or something <laughs> <laughs> no no it was as i told you we queued up and he came and shook hands with with the fans uh queuing up there and uh maybe uh yeah um Maybe he was a bit reserved because he couldn't understand why a guy from Germany queues up uh, there for visiting the NFL draft. Maybe that was the reason. <laughs> But, I see. Well, yeah, no, like like I said, he looked like he was a little bit disheveled. I don't know if you know what that word means and if it's uh, – He had too many. Late in the night, maybe he had some some right, shit. right. <laughs> so, but that's where we, you get to come in. I don't know if you can see this right here, but it's a DeLorean. Yeah, I, I know it. I love it, and uh, great fan, uh, great. Uh, I, I, I I don't know how many times I uh, saw Marty and Doc Brown <laughs> and uh, Biff. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know, but I like. Well, this is this is the part of the show where you get to be Biff, the old man Biff, where he knocks his cane and he gets to go back in time. So your first DeLorean moment, you're going to go back in time. You're going to go to that part where you actually got to see Goodell, but you're going to freeze time and you're going to go take him to the bar, the restaurant, whatever it is. And you get to have a drink with him and chat with any. You get to talk to him without yeah. anybody interrupting you. What kind of questions would you ask Roger Goodell back then? <laughs> Uh, if if he has a job for me <laughs> with the NFL <laughs> and uh, whatever job it is, I would take it uh, back then. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I no, that'd be that, a that would have been the the primary question <laughs> because working for the NFL, having football around me all the time, and and making your hobby as a job. What, what can you make? Uh, what can you dream more of? So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's perfect because that's what I'm trying to do with the Sports History Network here in my podcast. And the reason why we want to go with the DeLorean. So now that we're this, what this show is all about football history, but we're <laughs> wanted to get kind of your baseline of like why you get into football, even though you're from Germany. So let's let's do that. Let's stay with the DeLorean. Let's stay in the past and let's talk about the historical link between Germany and pro football way back when some of the guys I'm just going to leave it to you open 
just tell me about some of the historical links from Germany and pro football. So let's go to 3rd October 1920, first uh, official NFL game, then AF, APFA game uh, between uh, Columbus Panhandles and Dayton Triangles. There was one guy uh, for playing for the Columbus Panhandles who was part of the famous Nasser Brothers, and the Nasser Brothers uh, were the famous were famous brothers and NFL players from the Ohio League, and and such guy playing for the Columbus Panhandles was Phil Nasser in the first game of the NFL, and uh, actually he was born in Germany, and actually what was more evident for me to follow him and and to dig deeper into the history of him was that he lived uh, seven or seven miles away from where I'm living now. So it's a local connection uh, to to that guy, to that family. And um, when I saw that two years ago, um, I, I looked for a player like, like, Ralph Moisienko, it was a German punter in the NFL, and I saw him in the YouTube footage of nineteen late eighties, and I looked into the German uh, birthplaces of of NFL players on ProFootballReference.com, and I saw uh, the Nessa brothers, and I saw John and Phil Nessas who lived uh, in the in my hometown area. So. Yeah, so it was the first NFL ever NFL game, as Chris Willis pointed out in, in, in the book of the Columbus Panhandles. One week earlier, there was already a game which counted for the uh, um, um, uh, standings, but was not an official NFL game because it was not. It were not two uh, founding members of the APFA. <laughs> it was a week after, and. Um, they also played against Fritz Pollard, the, the Nassers, and um, yeah, um, in, 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 in the year after, it was also the first father-player connection, the first and only father-player connection of the Nasser, one of the Nether brothers and his son. It was um, f- uh, not, not Phil Nasser, it was Ted Nasser who snapped the ball to his son, Charlie, so it, it's the only father-son connection in an NFL team ever until today. Maybe Tom Brady uh, can uh, <laughs> can come to that point in the next five to ten years. I don't know, but um, that was that part. And they played against the brother and uncle. So uh, it's also one of the only... Um, um, times in the NFL history that there was father son playing against brother uncle and um, yes yeah, so that was the reason and, and the point I want to know why those guys um, yeah or want to see those guys in the first NFL game ever being played and American football was a bit uh, yeah, different from what it's played now, of course. And as I learned in the last years, so when I when I checked uh, the evolution of the game, and um, I think um, yeah, it, it was another time. And and um, how 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 did they come uh, to Columbus? Maybe that's an interesting question. So they. The family or their father worked here in Germany for the railroad, and um, he worked in the German France um, border area. Border area, and um, he was annoyed and and uh, a bit of shock of the German uh, French or Prussian French war, and and he wanted to leave and go out uh, and and leave the war area. Uh, late eighteen, uh, late nineteenth century, and um, he was hired by the um, Pen uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Company, and and that was the reason why he went to Ohio. In, in and and then uh, the sons got connected with the Ohio League and the Columbus Panhandles, as they 
as that was the name for the team the first two years, I think, or three years. And then it became the Columbus Tigers. So, yeah. That would be my first uh, pinpoint where I like to travel in the in the DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and speaking of that too, you you brought up a friend of the show, Chris Willis, and his books, and in that article that you sent me, which we'll have to get that on the website of you, the 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 local German article of you holding up two of his books. I mean, how did that all come to be? Why they put that article in your local newspaper? So, as I told you at the beginning, nobody around here in Germany knows about that player having played in the first NFL game ever. And when I saw it, I thought maybe I, I tried to raise awareness, especially against the background that uh, this year will be the first NFL game, NFL regular season game. There were preseason games and play, being played in, in Berlin early 1990. Um, but... Um, yeah, I want I want to raise awareness, and I still want to go a bit uh, wider um, in 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 Germany, maybe um, to more yeah, like Jump TV or maybe not Jump TV, but also a bigger newspaper. And I try, and I thought maybe it would be a good starting point to go to the local newspaper uh, from the hometown area of the Nessers to uh, ask them. Do you want to um, publish an article at the Super Bowl weekend uh, about the NASA brothers and uh, all the involvement uh, around the NASA and the NFL? And, and they said, oh, oh, yes, we are interested. And uh, come on, uh, let's take a picture in, in the hometown of the NASA in front of the chapel or, or church um, in, in the middle town, the uh, older area of the, of the village. And yeah, we went there and, and he asked me to take the books with me um, from Chris Willis. So it's old leather where it's uh, um, a, a, the Nessus are described with, uh, within and also, of course, the Columbus Panhandles where there are a lot of pictures of the Nessus. And uh, yeah, so that's why we took the picture in front of the church, in front of that chapel and... Uh, they published an article on Super Bowl Saturday, and um, it got a good feedback around the here. But it's only locally, so maybe I, I try to go out uh, a bit more uh, broader area to to publish it. Okay, yeah, I mean that again. I my German is definitely not anywhere where it used to be, and even then, I. I could only barely read a few words, so let's just say I, I, I can't pretend to read <laughs> read that article. So maybe if someday we could get it in English, maybe you can even post it on the Sports History Network website if you'd like. I mean that that'd be a way to share that too, and then you could always push it along. But uh, what about any other? I mean, you gave me a list of names that you could bring up. I mean, Saxted or Mar. I mean, go go ahead and tell me a next story if you wish about one. Yeah. Of them. So so the first NFL touchdown by a player born in Germany and and uh, so so maybe I, I should start there that uh, if, if you check and uh, where all the players in the NFL were born and if you go outside North America um, USA and, and Canada and you see where people are born uh, one country um, uh, pops up and that's Germany because of course the uh, U.S. bases, uh, there are, I, I believe, 89 players uh, being born in Germany and um, most of them are true Americans and, and whose families were here uh, due for working for a U.S. Uh, military base or being uh, soldiers at, at, at that, those military bases. But there are a few players who uh, left Germany who emigrated or immigrated to the U.S., before uh, the uh, whole war time, and in 1941, I believe it was 41. Let me check my uh, notes. I got it was in 1941, and and sorry for that that I had to to look at because it was on the um, Pearl Harbor attacks uh, on on that day when the first German. It was also a Sunday, and it was an NFL game day, and uh, it was the Eagles against the Redskins, and 
One German player scored a touchdown. He caught a touchdown. It was uh, Heinrich Wilhelm Piero. And, and maybe for Eagles fans, he's more, uh, more known as Hank Pyro. And he scored, uh, yeah, the first touchdown by a, a player born in Germany. So, um, it's, yeah, for, for me, it was weird to see, okay, there's, there's a player before the whole, U.S. military bases in Germany time who was in the USA and scored a touchdown in the NFL. So it, it was crazy to see. And also that, yeah, that special touchdown, I, I'd like to uh, check uh, when, when I go back in time with the DeLorean. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that's and another, it, that's a stop on the trip. You're going to go watch that, that touchdown live is what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> Watch it and see it, and and also, um, yeah, check check the atmosphere on that day because I I think it was, as I saw in an article on uh, was it Cleeter Report or um, the Athletic, it was a special day in in the USA, and also around the atmosphere on that day uh, must must, and I think a Cleeter Report article says the most forgotten game day ever, or most forgotten game ever because yeah other things were more important for for the usa on that day um yeah and 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 then um an, another uh trip i want to do is um the only pro football hall of famer born in germany is uh Ernie Stautner. um he is a was a defensive end for pittsburgh steelers and uh, the first year of uh, Hall of Fame inductions in 1960, let me check, uh, 1963, I think, is the day of the first Hall of Fame insurance, um in Canton, and uh, Annie Stautner was uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, and there's a bust of a German-born player <laughs> in Canton, and what kind and, and I would go with the DeLorean during the time when he and his family, he was three years old when he left Germany with his family. Because when I looked on the German players born in Germany in the NFL, I saw there was another player who played just two or three games in the NFL. It was five, six games in the AFC for Chicago Hornets, amongst others. So not not necessarily in the NFL, but it was uh, Francis Aschenbrenner. He was the Rose Bowl MVP of the 1949 Rose Bowl. And when I checked or read about both people, uh, Ernie Staudner, the Hall of Famer and Pittsburgh Steeler, and Francis Aschenbrenner, the Rose Bowl MVP of 1949, I saw that they left Germany at the same age. They were three years old with their families. And they came from the same area. Um, it's in, in uh, northern Bavaria. And um, not only the same area, but within 15 miles or 10 miles, the families in the same year, they left Germany. And, and uh, um from two families, there were two professional NFL players or two players who made had an impact, being the Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl MVP, and and the um, um, and 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 the and, and Hall of Famer. And I I would like to see maybe those, and and that's something I want to raise awareness again here in Germany and and go out to to the new local newspaper again. And, and check them and ask them, do you know about that incident? And uh, I, I would like to go back with the DeLorean and check if the, both families were related and went together to the U.S. back then. And, and uh, that, that would be very interesting. And maybe it's a hidden point in that relationship I, I'd like to know about. <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, from 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 that perspective, um, as I told, as I sent you in my email, what, what, what I kind of, well, which game I find very interesting is the epic of of Miami uh, in in 1982 between San Diego and uh, the Miami Dolphins, and uh, I would go yeah, to a more modern time with my DeLorean then, and and go to the 80s, 82. 
the playoff uh, as a bigger playoff because of the uh, strike of the player strike in 1982. There were uh, 16 team playoffs play and uh, the Epic of Miami, uh, the Epic in Miami, I think it's called um, was one of the greatest games ever played back then. And, and it went back and forth between San Diego and, um, and the Dolphins and for the Dolphins, There was one kicker, uh, Uwe von Schaman. Uh, he came from Berlin and um, he went to uh, to near to my hometown area, to Luxembourg. Lived there for 10 years with his mother and then they left to uh, Fort Worth in Texas. And he became the kicker of uh, Oklahoma Sooners for four years. And uh, he made the kick and then one, one famous kick for the Oklahoma Sooners. And then he got drafted from the Dolphins and was the successor of Gary Premi. And I think in the last, uh, yeah, in the last issue of the Cuffin Corner, it was portrayed that the kicker before Gary Premi was Kurt Kremser, a German kicker, and the kicker after Gary Premi um, for the Dolphins was also a German, and that was Uwe von Schaman. Uwe von Schaman. Uh, I don't know. You, have you ever watched Ace Ventura? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Arnie, okay, uh, Uwe von Schaman is a picture of uh, the kicker uh, who uh, uh, the laces out <laughs> kicker and uh, who failed it. And uh, that's a picture of that kicker. That's Uwe von Schaman, so Miami Dolphin kicker. And what's interesting in the epic of Miami is that the kicker, and I don't know if anybody here in Germany knows about that, and I don't know even in, in, in the U.S. if anybody knows about that, because for the San Diego Chargers, the kicker was Rolf Benerschke, and Rolf Benerschke uh, was, his, was born in the USA, but his father was a very famous uh, zoologist or biologist and, and active for the San Diego Zoo, and so Rolf Benerschke kicked for San Diego and also in the end of the game there went kicks back and forth and, and between Uwe von Schaman and Rolf Benerschke and when I saw that 10 or 15 years ago I thought it's amazing that there were two kickers in one of the most famous NFL games with uh, yeah, with relation to Germany so um, it's it's I, I would like to talk with them and about the game and about if they to that time knew about that that there is a connection between them and they could actually talk in German to each other I don't know if they know about that <laughs> so that would be interesting yeah so now we are in 1982 and um, yeah, there's, there's another NFL player born in Germany um, okay Mar Mar Marcus Cook or yeah, as you would Uh, say it in, in the US um, Cook or Koch uh, was the first Super Bowl winner and he went a long time unnoticed here in Germany until Sebastian Frauma uh, went to the Super Bowl with the Tom Brady led Patriots back then and uh, then the media already, uh, all of a sudden uh, recognized okay there's Marcus Cook uh, he was in the Super Bowl uh, at the beginning of the 90s I think with the Redskins uh, was it so And one interesting point I saw in that connection was that the Redskins played against, I think, the Giants in at the end of the 80s and um, on the part of the Redskins, um, there was Markus Koch and the punter I told you before, Ralf Moisienko, the reason why I checked that pro football reference about his uh, origins and He also was born in Germany. Um, but there was another player for the New York Giants, I believe, a running back or fullback, Scott Schwedes. And his father is Gerhard Schwedes. And he was a, um, a tailback or full, uh, tailback or running back for the uh, famous team from Syracuse where Jim Brown played. Uh, not Jim Brown, sorry, Ernie Davis played. And in the film, uh, The Express about Ernie Davis and, and his, um, 
uh, yeah, uprise in, 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 in Syracuse and, and then for the Cleveland Browns as, as the successor of Jim Brown. Um, there's one player um, who threw him the pass against the Texers uh, in, 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 in the Cotton Bowl in the 50s. And it's Gerhard Schwedes. It's his father. And uh, Gerhard Schwedes, I, I saw that film and, and there was one guy who says at one point, yeah, I'm, I'm Gerhard Schwedes. And I thought, oh, this, this name sounds very German. And I checked it. Yeah, actually, he, he was born in Germany, played in the NFL, I think also just six or seven games. But uh, also uh, portrayed in the media in a very good film uh, from my perspective, The Express about Ernie Davis and, and his career and um, or his life, um, you must say, because unfortunately he, he hadn't, didn't have a career. But um, yeah, it's... Uh, um, also, Judge Schwedes, I, I would like to cover with the DeLorean, his, uh, how he came to that point and then played for the Syracuse Orange Man. <laughs> so maybe th those are the pinpoints and, and the important points I would like to cover with the DeLorean. <laughs> so those would be like your pit stops on our road trip and then exactly, yeah. th through the history. I mean, there's a lot more I know out there and there's something that you have at the time of this recording, it's not released, but there's an upcoming coffin corner article that's going to be released what's that going to be about it's exactly about that what what i talked about it's about the relationship of the nfl the first game in the nfl and now we are here in germany and have the first nfl regular season game um so um in, especially about nfl players and their connections and um, so I started with all guys from Germany who had no connection to American football before and and went playing American football in the U.S. And um, I, I talked about that with the editor and he told me, okay, maybe we, we try to yeah, have a mixed... Um, mixed uh, content that that we also cover guys who are from the US and were born in Germany like um the kicker from KC um Nick um nah maybe um uh, we have to check his name again Nick um it's it's a f uh, best kicker ever for the Chiefs and and now the name I got lost uh, the name is lost sorry and uh, Nick I don't know. In any case, he also made the first and a professional football touch in in Germany and um, within uh, within the international bowl being played in uh, Berlin in 1991, I, I believe. So um, Nick Lowry was that, and he he made the first uh, professional football touch in Germany and uh, American prof American football touch. NFL touch, if you will, and uh, within such international uh, bowl game in, in Berlin. And uh, he was born in Germany as a uh, son of a um, military base uh, employee and uh, no, no, no soldier, I believe. I think it was his mother who worked for the uh, military base and that to that extent. I have to check again, but yeah. So... We put also those guys into that article and try to, to have a mixed content about players from Germany with no relation to American football before in their lives, as I came to the, <laughs> similar to me coming to the Cleveland Browns, um, with no uh, relation to American football before. And, and uh, so we also in, included... Um, Guys from America being born here, like like the fullback for the Kansas City Chiefs, to, uh, Tony Richardson. Um, I think he was. Uh, he's no Hall of Famer, but he was an All Decade uh, fullback uh, in the 2000s. So yeah, that that will be about the NFL players with connections to Germany, and hopefully, I haven't received any feedback from Mark Durr, who. Um, 
who's responsible for the issues and uh, when such article will come out. But hopefully it will come out before the first uh, regular season game being played in Germany. Okay, well, I mean, we have an upcoming article. That's one one way that the fan of the show can find you. But if they want to learn a little bit more about you or any of your work, where would you tell the listener of the show to go to? Yeah, it's it's currently it's only the coffin corner, uh, so they have to wait for for the, this article. And um, okay, the, that could be so. Um, I think over Facebook, I have a bit locked my profile. It's um, uh, Pete uh, Bo, like like the French word of uh, nice. Uh, it's B. A U and a nerd uh, like the nerd. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm written B O N E R T, uh, but but uh, I changed a bit in Bo like the French nice and nerd like the nerd and and um, on Twitter um, actually I don't know it's it's the Bo nerd I, I believe. Uh, Arnie, maybe you can tell me what my name is on Twitter because you <laughs> <laughs> you send me the uh, message on on Twitter. Uh, uh, we'll have to take a look at it, and I mean the whole purpose of that is so if someone want to get in touch yeah. with you, and we'll we'll go ahead and leave links in the show notes for anybody that wants to get in touch yeah. with you. And with that being said, so any last words of gridiron knowledge nuggets, or any last words of wisdom you want to give to the listener of the show? Yeah, uh, there's. Yeah, maybe that I I don't know. Uh, are the people who listen to your show uh, are are they very much involved into uh, pro football history or is it? Yeah, my show is specifically football history. Yeah, no, no, no. The listener or are there newcomers who don't have any idea? Because otherwise, I would say uh, there any time there's something you learn about pro football history, be it tactics, be it. Uh, uh, History, be the relationships between the players, people, coaches, owners, and so on. So, um, I, I started to create a library here in Germany with books I, I wait uh, six weeks or eight weeks for. And, uh, um, anytime you, you find out something new, and, and, uh, that's, I think, something great that, uh, there are books you, you, you can, can look into and, and learn always new things about American football, pro football and, and the NFL and, and special. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and also from, from, yeah, we, 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 uh, I, I would call me a pro football historian. Maybe, uh, hopefully you consider me also as a pro football historian, although I'm from Germany, but, um, hopefully that we can, uh, maintain, that historical connection of that great sport it it has become over the last decade uh, last century and and uh, maintains the history and historical background with with all the good and also the negative sides that that uh, that um were involved into our sport and uh, i'm i'm happy to join uh, your podcast again and, and 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 to hear it also uh, more frequently than i did before so um yeah um happy to 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 maintain historical connections of the nfl and pro football there you go someone five hours ahead of us some well <laughs> that is if you're like me on the eastern standard time zone that is someone willing to watch monday sunday night games at like maybe three in the morning Happy to keep history alive for a sport all the way across the Atlantic. So I got to just say thank you, Peter, for joining us on this ride. And as Peter said in the interview, he has an upcoming article in the Coffin Corner. Now, this is a magazine put out by the Professional Football Research Association. And to get there, all you got to do is head over to profootballresearchers.org and register to become an official member and eligible to receive the Coffin Corner when it releases. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, again, I highly recommend that you mash that little subscribe or follow button so you get notified as soon as the episodes are released. And again, it's free. But, including our email newsletter, which you can get to by heading to sports 
historynetwork.com forward slash newsletter. Now, as we transition to the next episode, I'll give you a hint. There's still going to be a seat open for you. Because we're talking to Tim Hanlon from the Good Seat Still Available podcast about some of the defunct leagues and teams in pro football history. But for now, dude, I am through if you're through. And for Peter, I'll feed a Zane. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.